Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's Senate Occasional Lecture. My name is Maureen Wicks. I'm the Deputy Clerk of the Senate. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge and show my respect to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people who may be present. We are very fortunate today, today to have as our lecture, lecturer, Mr. David Frickett, Director General of the Australian National Archives. Prior to taking up this role in 2012, Mr. Fricker worked in both the private and public sectors, including a 10 year period with the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, where he held the posts of Chief Information Officer and Deputy Director General. He was elected President of the Forum of National Archivists in 2013, appointed President of the International Council of, Archiv of Archives in 2014, and appointed Vice President of the UNESCO Memory of the World International Advisory Committee in 2015. Mr Fricker has the enormous task of providing proper stewardship of Commonwealth information. I am sure I'm not the only person in this room who has cyber stalked um, their barely known grandfathers by checking out their digital war records um, that the uh, uh, archives website has. Um, but we're not here today to recall our past. We're here today um, to talk about how our present might be preserved for the future. And in a time of um, social media and big data, I'm sure this isn't an easy task. Um, I might also take the opportunity to mention that the AC chapter of the Australian Study of Parliament group is running a post-lecture discussion discussion group immediately after this lecture um, for those who, for whom parliamentary discussion, there is no such thing as too much discussion. Um, the group is meeting in the Queen's Terrace, which is the public um, cafe out along um, at the other end of the building. And um, it's just along from the theatre and after Mr Fricker's lecture, um, you'll be able to grab a coffee there and discuss it if you want to carry on your discussion. Um, would everyone please welcome Mr Fricker. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maureen, for that welcome. And I should have done a bit more preparation before I got up here to put my, my notes down somewhere. Um, wait a minute, I might uh, get our little background slide back up on the screen as well. Uh, yes, so thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to present here at the Senate Occasional Lecture uh, Series on this topic. Um, May I also uh, acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people upon whose lands the city of Canberra has been built and may I also pay my respects uh, to their elders past and present and respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. Um, I might also just a uh, special acknowledgement to a former Director General of the National Archives of Australia, Brian Cox, and it's great to, um, to see uh, a colleague in the audience today, and um, I'm not sure if that means I'm going to get some difficult questions <laughs> uh, or not, but we shall see um, how we go. Um, as I say, I'm very grateful uh, for the chance to address uh, you all today on this topic uh, in Australia's Parliament House on the topic of government citizen, citizen engagement. Uh, and in particular, what I want to do is focus on the role of government information and government information management. Uh, and the role that that has uh, to improve that relationship between the Commonwealth Government and all Australians. And in particular, in this fast-paced digital age, um, what we can do with information management to build uh, the public's trust in public institutions and in the institutions of Australia's democracy and build trust and confidence uh, in the departments and the agencies that implement the programs and the policies of government. Um, particularly as we move into a faster and faster paced digital age. Uh, because in the digital age, it's information and it's raw information which is the new resource of the digital age. And as, as we are accumulating more and more data, we're creating information assets uh, with enormous potential. Now these information assets and the abundance of this information resource offers tremendous opportunities for government to deploy more um, advanced, 
more effective services in a much more agile and responsive way. And of course, with this age of information, it also presents many, many risks as well. Risks, for example, around personal privacy and indeed around national security. Um, but we're not going to realise all of the benefits of the digital age, and nor are we going to effectively mitigate the risks of the digital age unless we take information management very seriously. Uh, and my premise today is that what we, we need to take information um, seriously as a national resource and indeed as a national asset as we accumulate information. We've got to value uh, information as an asset. We've got to value our government data holdings as a national asset and we have to, in government, adjust our behaviours and our policies accordingly. The reason I'm here talking to you today is because this is the principal role of the National Archives. Our role at the National Archives is to ensure that the information collected, the information created by the Commonwealth Government upholds the integrity and the accountability of government processes and drives innovation and improvement across all the processes of government. And today I'd like to take this opportunity to outline the changes that we are making in the National Archives uh, to make sure that we fulfil this role in the digital age. Um, and talking about information as a resource uh, and as a national resource is still something relatively new. You know, often we're fascinated by um, the introduction of new technology, new whiz-bang apps, uh, and new uh, databases and these sorts of things. And that's, that's great. We should be fascinated by technology because it is, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, and, and it's wonderful and it's, it's very engaging and it's a sign of um, progress and it's a sign of innovation. Um, but we do need to talk about information as an enduring and valued resource across Australia. And that is something that we're not accustomed to seeing or talking about. Uh, we are accustomed, if I can use some analogies, to having lots of conversations. Right now we're having a major conversation around gas, for example, around energy. And we, we're very accustomed to us all having these discussions around uh, resources such as gas, uh, such as water, for example. And the reason we have these conversations about these resources is because we all understand that the security and the prosperity of the nation depends on the availability of these resources in particular availability that's predictable, reliable and consistent in quality. Both energy and water are key to every aspect of our lives. They're basic necessities for our health, for our education, for our industry and our, and our culture and our national culture. And so because of this, because we get it that these resources are essential for all of these things, we understand that our national prosperity will depend on our ability to manage those resources our ability to find the right market mechanisms to collect suppliers and consumers and to find the right regulatory framework to encourage innovation while ensuring interconnectivity and interoperability across a national supply network. And so there's another major resource that needs a similar treatment in this digital age and that is Australia's information resources. Because right now we're living in the information society and in this information society, just as we need water, just as we need energy, information itself has become an essential uh, for every aspect of our lives. And this is everything from our basic individual human rights right the way through to our economic prosperity and our national security. Um, for example, today, if we expect access to justice, if we expect our rights and entitlements to be recognised, if we expect to be enfranchised in our system of democracy, if we expect our public institutions to be accountable and to withstand the scrutiny and to be open to the scrutiny of the people they serve, if we expect the elimination of corruption across all government and public institutions, all of these expectations in the information society, in the digital age, can only be achieved. They must be underpinned by government information. And the government information has to be complete, it has to be accurate, it has to be authentic, and most importantly, it has to be accessible. And it has to be publicly accessible. Similarly, in our economy, our economy now is increasingly a digital economy. And when we think about the economic growth 
in Australia and around the world. When we think about the digital age, uh, we often talk about the unicorns and the disruptors uh, in the marketplace. And these unicorns and these disruptors that are most often used to define 21st century success actually come from the tech sector. And the reason they've found success is because they're able to obtain rich revenue streams through the provision of cheap, ubiquitous online services, and they've been able to connect consumers and consumables through clever information management. With national security, information management, again, is key to the way we think about and manage our security. Along with uh, land, sea, air and space, cyber is now well established as the fifth domain of warfare and indeed the domain of all of those hostile activities that uh, fall short of war, such as espionage. And at the national level, and within our multilateral mechanisms, within the international system, our proper stewardship in Australia of our government information has never been more important. To preserve our national security and also to maintain those trusted relationships that we have with our partners and our allies. At a more personal level, uh, identity, personal identity is also becoming more and more dependent on information, information that we have access to, information that we can use. Uh, it's also relevant to our national identity, how we think of ourselves as a nation, you know, how we conceive, how we conceptualise Australia's national identity. Again, which is quite topical as we look at uh, citizenship and what Australian citizenship means, as we have another conversation about what our national values are. Well, where do those values live? How are those values propagated? How do all Australians enjoy the benefit of those values and share those values? Because we're living in an age of mass movement of people. Now, mass movement of people is not new. Mass movement through war, through natural disaster, or migration, none of that is new. All of that is as old as human history itself. But what is new now is the globalisation of data. And the fact that geographical dislocation of people no longer necessarily leads to cultural dislocation of people. Now in the information society, it's quite easy for people to live a large proportion of their lives in a cyber bubble. People are able to select the news, they can select the opinions, they can select the entertainment that suits their own particular cultural values, uh, that aligns with their own concept of their own tribe. And while culture was once associated with a locality or a place, and as it moved with people around the world, it blended and adapted, perhaps best exemplified right here in Australia with our multiculturalism, which has grown and evolved as people came to this country and blended and contributed and absorbed the culture. Um, these days, with, with our information society today, it's. Uh, it's not so, not so much the case that culture retained as the collective memory of a society um, is not fixed geographically. Um, that collective memory of a society can be carried with all the convenience of a mobile phone and a person's tribe, the person that they, you know, the, the group that they collect, uh, collectively associate with, um, may in fact be completely unknown to the city or the place or the country in which they live. Now this, this idea of, of culture and this idea of a cyber bubble and this idea of culture independent from geography challenges our traditional ideas of what constitutes a person's identity, a nation's identity, and it is challenging our approach to social cohesion. And as we hear stories of radicalisation, uh, we more and more hear stories of how people are not participating in the benefits, not enjoying the benefits of society. They are in fact living in a very narrowly focused world largely fed by the internet and the information uh, society. So I say, you know, there are these challenges ahead, obviously, the information society that we live in and the growing importance of the information which is accessible, usable and discoverable by every individual. But it's not doom and gloom. Um, just as the, the challenges of the information society are unprecedented, well, so too is our capability to meet those challenges. In fact, a, a short time ago, I was saying how wonderful technology is and we should welcome innovation and the new technology which is coming our way. And when you think about it, the tools and the technology at our disposal to meet these challenges and to manage these challenges and enjoy the benefits of the information society uh, are beyond the imagination of even recent times.
Um, and if we, if we look at it, if we pin it, pick it apart, we could look at a few things which are really working in our favour. First of all, information itself. It's never, ever been more abundant. Thanks to the advent of digital technology and, of course, the internet, information on every topic is immediately and freely available. As it's often said, if you've got Wi-Fi, everyone is a genius. There is no question you cannot answer. There is no dinner party argument you cannot win, unless there's no Wi-Fi, in which case we're all idiots. <laughs> um, and we are. And this, this phenomenal expansion that we're all experiencing now, the, the expansion of information and the volume of information, um, is, is actually uh, being outstripped by the capacity of computational power, which is able to deal with it. So there's not going to be any shortage of storage capacity or processing capacity in the future as we continue to uh, experience this phenomenal growth in information. The other point that's of benefit to Australia is that the majority of the information out there is in English. And this benefits uh, English-speaking nations like Australia. Uh, and we often take that for granted. English-speaking nations often take for granted the uh, ubiquity of the English language and how that does actually uh, advantage us. As I say, the power of technology to deal with this growing volume of information is also growing at a phenomenal rate. And industry is producing more and more business models which are delivering these volumes of information to us, to governments, at little or indeed no cost. Many business cases are coming forward, like Google, uh, like uh, Facebook, like others, which are able to deliver this information to us uh, through their own revenue streams, usually advertising or otherwise. But this, this means the cost of dipping into this stuff is reduced to almost zero to both government and citizens. So this is a great uh, a bonus. Um, also, citizens themselves, all of us, are now more tech savvy than ever before. Again, this is beyond the imagination of, of the previous generation or even my own generation. Uh, I would never have imagined we would have the capacity and the technological savoir faire that we all have today. Um, right now, um, if, we, if we look at the Bureau of Statistics uh, 2015, uh, so this is going back a couple of years stats, 86% of Australian households have internet access and 97% of households with kids under 15 years are connected. So we're, we're approaching uh, almost 100% saturation of internet penetration into the households around Australia. And not only are we seeing the majority of households connected to the internet, but as technology improves, people have got increasingly powerful computers and personal devices at their disposal. Now this all sounds wonderful. This sounds very promising. I know the trajectory is brilliant. Uh, we've got an abundance of information, uh, services coming to us almost free. Uh, we've got growing uh, capacity in terms of the technology at our fingertips. Um, so it's a free market. It's a free market at work. It's a free market delivering benefits. So why am I here today talking about a national approach? And why am I here today talking about the need for government intervention, the need for the National Archives to do something to make sure that we maximise the benefits? Well, let me, let me just use that water analogy once again. If you think about the internet, if you think about communications technology, uh, these are like plumbing is to water. So the internet, the technology we use are the pipes, they're the taps, they're the reservoirs, they're the faucets, the filters that deliver information like water into the cups and the bowls of our households. Um, but what we also know is that even if you have state-of-the-art plumbing, it's actually the quality of the water that we will live or die by. And in these days, in these recent times around Australia, we also know that at times of abundance, when we're surrounded by floodwaters, that's when you have to be the most careful about the water you drink, the water you use to wash, the water you use for irrigation. And, and so it is for information, because this incredible abundance and this free availability of information uh, might feel like we're, we're blessed with riches. But in fact, it's very important for all the reasons I mentioned earlier that we've got to think about whether information is fit for purpose. Um, how authentic is that information? How usable is that information? How permanent is it? Will it still be here tomorrow? Will it still be usable tomorrow? Um, and of course, how usable is it? Can it be used and reused for our purposes to deliver the benefits of the information society? And as I've said, from the National Archives point of view, and the theme that I'm talking about today, if we're going to build trust 
in public institutions and ensure that Australians are receiving the very best public services, well then government needs to act to guarantee that when people go looking for information and they find government information, they're finding the real thing. And it's on the, front, and it's on the first page of the Google search. It's no good at popping up on the third or second page. As often said, if you want to hide a dead body, you put it on the second page of a Google search. Nobody ever looks there. So we have to be in front and we have to be where people are. Now there are some notable international uh, developments that also uh, draw attention to this and I just want to briefly touch on these because there's a fair bit of international context driving us uh, on the way ahead. One is the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So in 2015 the UN introduced the Sustainable Development Goals. They were a, goal, a set of 17 goals and they are designed to end poverty, to protect the planet, ensure prosperity for all as part of a new sustainable development agenda. So this is the United Nations best shot at having a world, a peaceful and prosperous world. Each of those 17 goals has a set of targets and the targets are there to be achieved by 2030. Uh, they build on the success of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, but these apply to all countries, including Australia. And it's a call to action for us to achieve economic growth, social inclusion and protection for the national and uh, natural environment. Now the reason I mention those is because perhaps by well, now you wouldn't be surprised, I'm about to tell you, those sustainable development goals are underpinned by government acting uh, to manage its information resources properly, to benefit citizens through government information management. In particular, goal 16, uh, which embraces targets to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. And goal 16 is underpinned by laws, policies and systems addressing the accessibility long term of government information. So there are targets in there to reduce corruption and bribery in all forms, to develop effective, accountable and transparent institutions, to provide a legal identity for everyone through birth registration, through public records, and to ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedoms in accordance with national legislation and international agreements. So these are basic human rights. These are the basic essentials for prosperity, for development, coming back to governments, managing their information correctly and making them publicly accessible uh, where they should be provided. There's another one, the Open Government Partnership, uh, which is an international initiative established in 2011 that aims to secure concrete commitments from governments to promote transparency, to empower citizens, to fight corruption and harness new technologies to strengthen governance. Now Australia is one of the 70 countries who have signed up to the Open Government Partnership. And in 2016, late last year, December, the Australian Government released Australia's first Open Government National Action Plan and the National Archives is a, a central participant in that plan. It was a result of a major coordinated effort by government and civil society, the business sector and academia. And this plan commits Australia to an agenda for the next two years to strengthen the transparency and accountability of government and to build citizens' trust in Australia's governance and its institutions. And here again, the agenda grabs the opportunity of the digital age and the possibilities of records and information management to accomplish its goals. So some of the highlights of the National Action Plan are to achieve open data and digital transformation. So work with the research, the not-for-profit and private sectors to identify and release high-value data assets. So this is government um, treating its data as public data to make sure it's out there as fuel for the digital economy and, and fuel and, and a resource for the, uh, the information society. There, there are also targets in there to engage with the public and improve privacy, risk management capability, across government, again, to build trust around data sharing and release, so responsible sharing of information. You know, government has um, a, an obligation to be open to public scrutiny, but every citizen has the right to privacy. And so all of these targets are set for the responsibility uh, to a responsible release of government information as public data while protecting personal privacy. Um, there are other targets in there around ensuring access to government information. Uh, and in calling on the archives and others to make sure that we are ramping up our, our um, efforts to make sure that government data belongs to the people 
and is out there for the people. And the final one with the Open Government Partnership is about integrity in the public sector. Again, building trust in public institutions. And that means strengthening Australia's to prevent, detect and respond to corruption in the public sector uh, through ensuring transparency in government procurement. Um, and so this comes back to government information, government records, records management, uh, stewardship of government information being there and preserved and protected to support the scrutiny and accountability of government institutions. I'll just briefly mention UNESCO as well. Um, as, as Maureen said, I'm a, a, a vice president on the UNESCO Memory of the World Committee. The National Archives is heavily involved with UNESCO. Um, UNESCO have made a couple of declarations and instruments which also call on all member states to uh, uh, preserve and respect their cultural documentary heritage uh, as a means to uphold the human rights of all citizens and as a means to enrich the economic but also the cultural prosperity um, of all. And there was a recommendation uh, passed in 2015 by UNESCO concerning the preservation of and access to documentary heritage, including in digital form. And this documentary heritage includes government records and it calls upon memory institutions, such as the National Archives of Member States, um, to, to uh, recognise the fundamental importance of archives, not as a historic community, not as a historic curiosity, but as the foundation for good governance. So they, these are all you know, things. What I'm impressing upon you, and I'm hoping I'm convincing you all passionately, uh, that success in the information society at economic, at cultural, at social, at individual level, are more and more dependent on our access to and use of information. And just like water we drink, it's got to be quality information. We have to be able to depend on it. And it can't just be information which is up there for five minutes and disappears. It's got to be there forever, the important stuff. We have to rely on it. So what are we doing about this at the archives? Well, first of all, just to remind you why I'm the one giving this lecture and, and not somebody else from the, the bureaucracy, the National Archives uh, is um, the lead agency for setting information management obligations and standards for Commonwealth government entities. So this is absolutely core to the function we perform at the archives and the role that we have. And our mission is quite clear. Our mission is to ensure that the essential records of government are being kept and ensure that they remain accessible and reusable into the future. So we're keeping this stuff to use today, but it's gotta be usable 10 years from now, 100 years, a thousand years from now. And of course, we have to deliver this mission now uh, with strategies that are suited to the digital age. And this moving into the digital age is affecting every part of our business and everything that we do. And our centrepiece to respond to this uh, is our digital continuity policy, which we launched in October 2015. Now, digital continuity, uh, the, the, the term digital continuity means, uh, just there's only two words, it won't take me long to explain it, um, is of course we're embracing the digital age and the opportunities of the digital age, but continuity is important. We're not keeping records just for one department or one agency to use for this one particular transaction. We're keeping records on a continuum. We're keeping records as a national asset because we are now seeing records that were collected 100 years ago for one purpose, to keep property boundaries or to track a, uh, a river course or to measure vegetation. They were collected for one purpose as an administrative requirement many years ago, but today they are informing uh, debate and scientific research around climate change. You know, these, res these records are essential for that. Um, we're looking at records that were kept many, many years ago today to help us understand Indigenous Australians, the history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians and what we should be doing, how they should be recognised, how our reconciliation is proceeding. So records live forever and records will always deliver purposes well beyond the imagination of those that created those records and that's what we need to be do. So it's a long-term availability and accessibility of government records is what we're about with digital continuity. And as I say, it's, it's, uh, it looks beyond uh, the technology of the day because government must purchase new technology. We must renew, we must innovate, we must always be adopting uh, new technology and advances in technology. We must constantly be moving from one platform to the next. But while we all understand uh, that technology becomes obsolete, while we all know that the phones we're using today and the computers that we have at home or on our desk will be gone five years from now, we know that the data we're collecting, 
the information that we're having, the photographs that we're taking and that we're keeping on these things, the value will only increase over time. And so while technology becomes obsolete, while, while technology becomes smaller and more temporary, data is becoming big data. You know, data is getting bigger and it's becoming more permanent. And it's that pivot, you know, we've got to switch our view about the residual value of government processes and government systems away from the billions of dollars that we spend on technology to the billions of dollars worth of assets that we're accumulating in government record. And so our digital continuity policy advances strong governance frameworks to ensure that information is properly valued and managed accordingly. It makes sure that government departments, agencies of government, just in the way that they have governance arrangements around the money they hold, around the human capital, the people they employ, we have those governance arrangements now around the information that's being collected. So every data set which is being collected, aggregated, maintained by a government agency will have governance, information governance. We know why that data is valued. We know is that data sensitive. We know who has access rights to that data. And we know that when the technology becomes obsolete, how will that data be carried forward, the continuity? How will the value of that data be maintained and how will it be kept reusable well into the future? So this is valuing the data as an asset and it's applying information governance frameworks to make sure that we are carrying that information from one generation to the next. It also means that across government, a government is part of our digital continuity policy, information collected won't be left neglected. Uh, in email accounts or on web servers or on shared drives or on portable devices. All the information we have coming into government agencies under these control frameworks will be valued, assessed for its value and it will be kept in controlled environments for as long as needed. Now I should point out the archives of course we talk about long-term preservation and reuse of information but don't forget only 10% of what's created by government in the way of records are worth keeping forever. You know, 90% of it is temporary in nature, is transitory, uh, it's not really necessary to be kept long term. So once the business requirement is, is faded away and diminished, it can be disposed of in an authorised, controlled way. It's that 10%, it's the essential evidence, what happened and why. That's what we need to keep forever and that's what we need to carefully preserve and carry forward. So that's the first part of our digital continuity, is to value information as an asset, as a national asset and treat it accordingly. Now all of our accountability, of course, depends on records being um, holding evidentiary value. So a second part of our policy is to maintain that evidentiary value, to maintain a chain of evidence of information. We have to be digital. So if you start a process as a digital process, and we all do in government, it usually starts with an email. No matter what you thought you were going to do when you come into the office in the morning, you are faced with your email first thing and that takes over your day. So all of government business starts with email. So it all starts digitally. And what we're saying at the archives is it's no good having a process which is a digital process, that document flows from that person to that person, it comes over here, and then it comes to an important stage of the process, it must be printed out on a sheet of paper, I must sign it with my fountain pen, and then back we go to digital, etc. That breaks a chain of evidence. That is not going to uphold government integrity in the future. When the historians 50, 100 years from now come back to look at us today, they're going to find, I don't know what they're going to find. I hope by then we'll have sorted it out. Though. But, but it's no good them finding a whole bucket of stuff in digital over here and then expecting them to come to Canberra into a warehouse and find one sheet of paper that completes the picture. Society won't work that way in the future. It has to be from cradle to grave kept as digital. So this is the second part of our digital continuity, is that all government processes are digital from cradle to grave. The final part of our, our um, continuity piece is, um, well, is, is vitally important, all three are vitally important, but it's interoperability. Now, I know it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. We hear it in defence uh, circles quite a bit when we talk about interoperability. But what I'm talking about here is when a public servant creates information, um, we all, all of us in the public service have to appreciate we're not creating the information for me, and I'm not creating it for the person on the other side of the counter from me. I'm creating this information forever. I'm creating this information for use and reuse into the future. I'm creating, even if I work at Centrelink, or if I work at the tax office, or if I work at the National Archives, I'm not creating it for my agency, I'm creating it so the Australian government can use it again and again 
whatever department, whatever agency. So it's got to be interoperable across, across space, across the different organs of the Australian government. And indeed, we've got to release this data into the public so that the digital economy can take advantage of it and use it to grow our digital economy. So it has to be interoperable across space. It has to be interoperable across time. So the data I create today has to be usable 50 years from now. Now, none of us, I think all of us have had the experience where we found uh, a document you know, on a disk or in a USB or, or in an old zip drive or you know, we were talking about VHS uh, video cassettes before. We're all accustomed to finding stuff that we've created not that long ago, but it's inaccessible to us now because technology's moved on and we've lost the capacity to, to review it, to read it. Well, this is interoperability. We, we have to achieve interoperability across time. So our continuity policy, digital continuity, is ensuring that government data created today will be interoperable into the future. So those as yet unimagined purposes and benefits of data will be achieved into the future. The other thing to remember here is that uh, there is a, a, a small proportion of government data. Most of it can be made publicly available very quickly. But we don't do that recklessly. There's information which has got sensitivity around it through personal privacy, through uh, confidentiality or for national security reasons. That information has to be uh, kept and the stewardship has to be responsible. The release cannot be reckless. We don't want Ed Snowden's in Australia. You know, it, it undermines the prosperity of this nation and causes people real harm. However, over time, sensitivity diminishes. Over time, everything will be made public. And I mean everything. It may take, uh, in the case of census information, personal private census information that we collect, that is guaranteed by law not to be released for 99 years. So it may be 100 years or more before things are released, but one day all the information we have will be made publicly available. If that weren't the case, we wouldn't bother preserving it. We wouldn't waste money keeping it. So it is about interoperability over time, as I say, because the public benefits when it has information it can use. So to get this um, to started, those three principles, value as an asset, digital processes from beginning to end, interoperability, our digital continuity proce uh, policy has uh, set targets for all public service agencies, or Commonwealth agencies in fact, to achieve by the year 2020. Um, we've also developed and we've made available a whole suite of products, uh, tech and resources to enable government agencies to pick up on this and to, uh, to run with this, uh, this journey. So we have a minimum metadata set, which has been published, a business system assessment framework, and a range of training products and resources that make it as easy as possible for government agencies to adopt and incorporate these practices. And we're not announcing this as a big project that needs to have millions of dollars spent within the next six months. We've given the Commonwealth until the year 2020 to pick these principles up as part of their ongoing investment cycles, as part of their procurement cycles, as part of their organisational restructures. Let's not forget, across the Commonwealth, we spend over $6 billion a year on ICT, $6 billion. So without asking for new money, what we're saying is within that $6 billion a year of investment procurement, you simply pick some of these values up as part of that that process, so it's doable, it's achievable. And as I say, we've released a whole suite of tools and guidance. And I'm very pleased, in fact, today to use this occasion to launch the latest in our suite of tools. And I've got to come over here to pick them up. Um, and this, this, I'm very pleased about this one in particular that we are able to, uh, that I am able to launch this uh, today. And it is uh, our drum roll, please. <laughs> it is, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Yes, well done. I present, I present to you all. Um, this is our information management standard. Now this is a, it's a beautiful document. It's beautiful in its simplicity, in its clarity, and its appearance as well. <laughs> May I also say it's free, it's free of charge. Um, I'm not like one of these museum directors that always thought, you know, has steps aside to sell you the catalogue. No, no, this is free, you can take this. Um, but what this does, uh, it, it brings it all together. So this unifies for all agencies of the, of the Commonwealth Government what the information management requirements are. It's principles based, it's simple, it's clear. It has eight quite simple uh, principles. Information is governed, the right information is created, you know, actually create a record. Um, it's adequately described, stored, preserved, etc. So there are eight simple statements. Each statement has just got a number of simple recommended actions. Now, in keeping with our government direction at the moment to reduce red tape, uh, none of this demands capital expenditure, 
None of this demands the diversion of resources. All of this, honestly, is simple, common sense statements of practices and behaviours and values that need to be absorbed into corporate governance frameworks to achieve information uh, management across the Commonwealth Government. And as you can see, it's a pretty slim document with lots of white space. So this is part of what we're doing, and this illustrates what we're doing, to make sure that the Commonwealth Government is being guided ahead and we are embracing the opportunities of the digital age. We're using all of the tools and the free resources out there at our disposal to bring the government into the digital age to be more effective, more efficient, to deliver better, richer public services in a more agile and responsive way. And most of all, to do that on the foundation of government information which is reliable, which is dependable. So every citizen, if they read something in the newspaper, if they read a tweet, if they're having a chat with their neighbour, if they see something on TV and they don't like it, well, if they're going to stay engaged with our democracy, if they're going to have a voice in this society, they need to be able to reach out at their fingertips and find the government information. They need to find the truth. And though that information they find has to be obvious, it has to be discoverable, it has to be compatible with the way they want to use it, the way they want to consume it, and it has to be information that they can rely on so that they can have a voice in democracy, so that they can have an influence in our government, so that, that they can have an opinion which has got equal weight with all of the other opinions in the, in the discourse and the debates and the arguments and discussion that go around across Australian society. So that's what we're doing in the National Archives. That's what we're doing across the Commonwealth Government to drive and to carry the government into the digital age and to build that trust, public's trust and confidence in a modern 21st century democracy in Australia. And our role in the National Archives is to make the right thing to do the easiest thing to do. And we're doing that by these simple and clear policies, guidelines and resources. So thank you all very much. I'd be very delighted to uh, receive any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Fricka, for a very interesting um, discussion. I particularly will be interested from a parliamentary point of view to have a look at that standard because we do have responsibility to hold material here, some of it very ancient, which um, as you would know is a frail uh, resource that we have. Um, we do have time for some questions. I would ask um, if you want to ask a question to raise your hand, as some people already are, and then I would ask you to approach the microphone so that your question will be heard. I'll call on you first, sir, and then you, madam, at the back. Thank you very much for a very stimulating lecture indeed. Um, there are two points I want to raise, please. The first is this. You mentioned, unfortunately, that... Um, that um, only 10% of the information is going to be mm -hmm. kept. Mm -hmm. In the digital age, I think this is very strange. Mm -hmm. I have left public service 13 years ago, and I will remember the outsourcing, uh, what we used to call brambling, of information. And that was usually carried out by rather junior staff who come in, who really had no idea of the what the, the department I was in was doing, and then got rid of information that we later found we could have very well used on policies and everything else. Yep. Now, that's a major concern for me. Mm -hmm. The second point that I want to raise is this, that you've talked about the information that government holds. Yes. Now, there are an enormous number of NGOs out there yep. that play an important role in uh, non-commercial NGOs. The commercial, they can look after themselves. But what is going to happen in terms of keeping the information that is going to be just as important to understand the society a hundred years hence mm. that we are in now? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Two excellent questions. So if I can take the first one first. I said the 10% um, that is kept. Now, that's not a target. We don't start with the premise that we're only going to keep 10%. We start with our uh, records authorities with an appraisal of what a government does and through a process of analysis and cooperation with each government entity, we go through the various functions that are performed in that 
uh, that agency, and based on that we identify the class of records that must be kept forever, the class of records that should be kept for say 10 years or until no longer necessary and then they can be disposed of. Uh, as it happens, based on that appraisal of significance, so as I said, we, we want the essential evidence, you know, we, we want to preserve the evidence of what government did and our, our client is the future. So we need to anticipate uh, what will be required in the future. So please, uh, I'm, I'm, thank you for asking this question. Um, we don't start with a target of 10%, it may be 18%. And you're quite right about the digital, by the way, um, the transformation. You know, as, um, looking around the room, I think we can remember, you know, before um, the, uh, the introduction of things like photocopiers and uh, facsimile machines, uh, only a, a fairly small amount of records were created in the first place. Once the photocopier became commonplace in offices, suddenly there was you know, tripling of the volume of records that were kept because of technology, because it was easy to create. Now digital technology is similar. We are creating a greater volume of information. So even 10% of the records that are created in the public service now is probably about 10 times more than what was created in the uh, previous uh, pre-digital era. So now we, we aim, we are very serious about this, we keep the essential evidence of government actions, decisions, uh, to uphold accountability and integrity of government and also for memory, national memory, uh, so that we do have that. So that was the, uh, the first issue around the, uh, the 10%. On the, on the other, and as I said, it, might, it may well be 18% as we uh, explore this further. On the other thing I'd say on that is, not every agency is equal either. So the um, Bureau of Meteorology, probably about 100% of their records are kept forever. You know, so it, it, can, it can change, you know, depending on the nature of the business of the agency. Um, on, the, uh, on the other matter about NGOs, this is also uh, a really uh, vitally important topic that the National Archives is dealing with at the moment. Government, uh, the, the way the government does business, the trend of government business is for government to do less and to outsource more of, uh, so public services are being contracted out more and more. Now, of course, we're accustomed to states, state governments performing uh, uh, functions which are funded by the Commonwealth, and that's fine. State governments have their own public records offices and they keep their records. But what about NGOs? And quite a recent one is the, um, the uh, Royal Commission into the abuse uh, sexual abuse of, of minors in, in the care of um, uh, institutions. Now this, these were, uh, th these are services provided by independent private institutions, but really at the government's bidding. You know, th these were providing a national service. And we are finding with that Royal Commission, as they search for records of what happened, as they search for the evidence, uh, it's very uneven, you know, the records that are kept by those institutions. Now we are taking measures including in our information management standard at the archives to make sure that even if Commonwealth Government services are outsourced, the agency, that the, the private enterprise which is being contracted to do this carries an obligation of record keeping. So they carry obligations of accountability so that ultimately the Commonwealth Government can be held accountable for what they did with taxpayers' money in the name of the citizens of this country. So it is very topical. It is also the case that business of government is being done quite often on third party platforms. You know, we've seen in the newspaper lately about the cabinet ministers using WhatsApp and, and other third party systems to communicate with one another. Um, these are not Australian systems. They don't even exist in on Australian jurisdiction. They're American software companies or they're in overseas jurisdictions. Again, we're picking up on saying, well, no, these are still records, they need to be kept. So even if you're using Gmail or using WhatsApp or other um, platforms, if you're a public official, if you're an accountable official doing the business of the government, you, you are accountable and those records must be kept. So I, I mean, I use social media, I use Twitter, but I keep those tweets as a record of what I have, the statements I've made, etc. And that's the example we're setting. So two very good topical issues. Um, they do both apply um, to the digital age, uh, but the first one is this, this general trend of, of pushing um, the delivery of public services to NGOs something we are very minded of. And, and that is uh, included in our information standard, making sure the right records are kept and made and kept in the first place. So thank you, thank you for that. Sorry, a very long-winded answer, and I, 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 yes. I'll try and be more brief. Excellent talk, um, which was very much about the principles, and I'm sure that we would all agree with them 100%. Good. As a user of data, I want to raise for you three practical issues. Hmm. First of all, standing as we are in this building, I cannot accept that government is simply executive government and administrative departments. 
But when I went to try and find the opposition's response to a major report in the mid-1980s, I could find no evidence anywhere mm -hmm. of the opposition's response to what was an important report on a matter of public policy. Mm -hmm. So there's a gap in major statements from Her Majesty's loyal opposition, if I might put it like that. Sorry, yes. those of you. Sorry to the Republicans, but it's just such a nice way of putting it. Um, it uh, and I don't mean the day-to-day -day rubbish. Mm. I mean the major policy mm. statements. So that's the first one. The second issue is that while um, I appreciate your comments about interoperability and, and you're standing there with your records looking into the future, there are major issues about interoper interoper interoperability currently. Mm -hmm. I recollect that when an Australian citizen ended up in a refugee camp some years ago, we discovered the Department of Immigration had a large number of different systems, mm -hmm. from memory about 17, and none of them talked to each other. And I can tell you that the current crisis on overpayments in Centrelink is because the Centrelink systems don't talk to each other and it's incompetent systems creating a problem. So we can't get interoperability right on a day-to-day -day basis. How does that challenge you preserving a record that people can use effectively. Mm -hmm. And my third question is about the quality of data. Mm -hmm. And here I'll use the example of so-called trade treaties. I use the term so-called because they're not about trade, they're about regulation. Now, the government is currently commencing negotiations with the European Union. It announced that it had an achievement. There's a single page on the minister's page. There's nothing on the DFAT website some weeks later. You have to go to the European Union to find any data, all right? And when they did the national interest analysis of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, it was a self-congratulatory, very short thing that totally failed in comparison to what the New Zealand government did. So if the government will not give you quality data, what hope is there for preserving a record? And, and I know your hands are tied a bit on this, but there are other institutions existing in society. And some effort has to be made to improve the quality when the government can't or won't. Mm -hmm. All right, now, thank you. Yes, a round of applause. I, I expect a round of applause for my answer as well when it comes to <laughs> The standing ovation, perhaps. Um, okay, look, the, the three, again, uh, three really good uh, things. Now, the first, if I can go to Her Majesty's opposition, first of all. Um, now, my hands are not tied in the other two, and I really do, but perhaps they are a little bit tied with Her Majesty's opposition, because the legislation is quite clear. Uh, uh, the Archives Act applies to the records of the executive, uh, not the parliament. So, they're, they're for very deliberate reasons. Uh, the judiciary is, uh, follows the separation of powers. So we are about preserving the records of the executive. Um, the parliament has uh, particular exceptions, uh, which includes the opposition, and uh, naturally, <laughs> and, um, and also the judiciary. Um, and so that, that can uh, affect the way in which records uh, fall subject to our policies and the way in which they are transferred to us. But I will say that both the parliament and uh, the courts uh, do opt in. And so they do use the archives uh, as a means to preserve uh, records um, on, a, um, on a voluntary, if you like, and a, an opt-in basis. Um, so, but it's, it all begins with uh, the legislation about what is guaranteed under legislation and what isn't. So that, that's the first one on uh, the parliamentary. And so records that even a government, a cabinet minister is also a member of parliament, of course, or a, a senator. Um, now, their, their um, party political work, their work with their local electorates, you know, these things are considered private to them and not covered uh, by the Archives Act. So there will be, when we talk about the machinations of parliament, it unfortunately becomes a bit of a legal discussion there. Well, not unfortunately, I mean, that's the way the law is, is written. Um, on the interoperability thing and the immigration examples that you mentioned, fantastic examples. This is precisely what we're doing with our digital continuity. You know, the, the Cornelia Rao, those sort of um, uh, scandals that you referred to, and then uh, the Palmer Review that came after that, pointed, and you know, audit um, uh, ANAO reports, you know, subsequent to that. And not picking out immigration, there are many departments which have uh, um, uh, been shown to this. All of these point to the need to establish stronger records management practices 
from the time pre-creation pre of the record, you need the systems and the policies in place to guarantee that the right records are being kept and made interchangeable, interoperable across systems. So that, that, those sort of examples are precisely the incidents and events that digital continuity, our policy is responding to. And we are making progress. It's not, um, you know, big departments like immigration, as you mentioned, but other major departments do have legacy systems. They do have systems which are quite old, which have been around for quite some time. But they are all working hard using the resources that we produce for data standards, metadata standards, information management standards, uh, to make sure that they absorb these principles as they redevelop, as they improve, as they enhance their systems, they're building in this compatibility across their systems. But more importantly, not only are they compatible across Centrelink or immigration, they're compatible with the rest of the Commonwealth as well. Now this is why it's Digital Continuity 2020, because I know, we all know that you can't do this straight away. It takes years to do this. But I'm much more satisfied knowing that we are moving forward over the next several years uh, than knowing that we're going nowhere, you know, that these problems are not being solved. So, you know, your point is, is perfectly valid, uh, but I just, you know, the, the, these are the things which are driving us to make this change. And everybody is seized, like from secretaries, from ministers, everybody is seized with the importance of getting this work done. With the quality of data, um, our hands are not really tied on this thing. I mean, um, it's a matter of uh, professional um, pride. You know, the government officials, all of us, need to take pride in the records we create. Because at the end of the day, you know, after, after I retire, after I'm long gone, you know, what's the value that I've left behind? Well, okay, the services that I've provided, these magnificent lectures I've delivered and the uplifting experience I've given all of you, these are wonderful outcomes, but they're, they're temporary. You know, you'll forget about me quite soon. But my long-term residual value, are the, really, it's the information I've left behind. It's the records I've created, the, the corporate knowledge that's been accumulated. So it is a matter of professional pride for every uh, Commonwealth and public servant to create good records. This is embodied in the information management standard I just launched. It's embodied in all the training products that we produce, in all of the programs that we run, and indeed uh, the pro programs that the Public Service Commission run, etc. Um, it is part of public service uh, code of conduct. It's part of uh, public service um, uh, professional standards. Um, so the quality is there and we can control the quality of data through our archives records authorities, we can insist by law, you know, that records, certain records are kept and retained. Now, how soon they're made publicly available, again, is a product of that particular agency and that propensity for these people to make data available. I don't mind saying public servants, in my view, we have a tendency towards secrecy and not towards public accessibility. And I, I think that's wrong. You know, I think that's something we have to keep changing. But the way we're going to change that culture of away from secrecy and towards public accountability um, is because public servants need to be confident that the information they're making public is, is not, they're not um, betraying national secrets, you know, they're not accidentally revealing private information. Uh, if a public servant knows that their information governance is strong, if they know that these records have been made the right way, that this data set is what it says it is, that they've, they're part of a, a governance framework, they can confidently release data um, and, you know, and that's the way we manage the risk of, uh, of inadvertent uh, release of sensitive information. You know, so this, this is all part of building a culture across the public service which is pro-disclosure and, and you know, relieves this sort of feeling that we all must be terribly secret and you know, FOI is our enemy and all this sort of stuff. We've got to get over that. And we've got to stop whinging about FOI legislation. We've got to work with it. Because our value as public servants is the public data that we create, you know, the services we create, but the information we produce. So it's very important to me, and it's very important to the way we construct these policies and guidelines, that we're building, as I said, the, the easiest thing to do is the right thing to do. So we're making it easy for people to create information which is ready for release, or information which is clearly sensitive and must be protected. You know, these are the things that all of this comes from good governance, which creates good practice. Another very long-winded answer. I know I'm running out of time. Um, yes, and we've got... Oh, yes, that's right. My applause, because yes, that was a very good answer. Absolutely. And we have quite a few questioners, and I would say we only have time for one more question. So... Someone is on their feet. Um, I will <laughs> go to that gentleman. 
I'm sorry, Thank it's very difficult. No. Thank you. I'd appreciate your saying a little bit more about how your office goes about deciding what records are kept and which are destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask that question by reference to one example where I thought some files dealing with a major policy, public policy issue should have been kept. Mm -hmm. uh, late last year, I was asked to do an oral history interview by a university <coughs> relating to some major reforms on, relating to the federal court. And to refresh my memory, I tried to get the files out of archives. The files would have included records of negotiations with the Chief Justice of the Federal Court, submissions to the Attorney General, policy analysis of the relationship between the executive and the judiciary, major public policy issues in my view. And I was very surprised to find, uh, after checking with both the archives and the department, that those files had not been kept. Mm. So perhaps I don't expect you to be familiar with the particular files, but if you can say a little bit more about why some important public policy files are not kept. Mm. Um, look, very briefly, um, important public, public policy, you know, policy formulation, you know, the, the policy that becomes law, that becomes um, uh, enacted, and it, it directs the behaviour of government and public servants should be kept. So, our records authorities that we produce, as I said earlier, um, analyse the activities of government agencies and uh, determine uh, those classes of records that are to be retained as national archives, preserved um, in perpetuity. Um, and, and yeah, you're right, unfortunately, I'm not aware of that, that particular case. But it is on, um, it's, it's around, um, you know, these documents are important to demonstrate you know, Australia's system of democracy. These documents are important to illustrate why laws have been passed the way they have. Documents that are important to preserve the rights and entitlements of individuals, such that you know, in the future, if, if people are entitled to a pension or some entitlement, it's there, or land, or whatever it might be. Um, and also history, you know, the historical importance of uh, a particular episode um, that, you know, Australian, in Australia's history. So you can recognise, might not meet those criteria, but it's important for that. And now we're also looking at economic value. So data sets which should be preserved for the long-term economic value that they produce. Now I would say, based on the description that you gave during your question, the class of documents uh, which include briefs to you know, the High Court or briefs to uh, the Minister that include uh, policy advice um, that you know, eventuate in, um, in legislation being passed or debated, yeah, would ordinarily be kept. So I'm not familiar with that um, example, as I say, and neither would I say that mistakes never happen. And you know, in the one one thing is in this information standard is an emphasis on creating records in the first place, uh, because often the, in historically archives have come in towards the end of the process and gone in to look at the records which have already been created and are held by an agency. And by then, if the records were not made in the first place or, or um, have not been well looked after, you are dealing, you're playing catch up. With our digital continuity and with our, actually all of our advanced policies, we are trying to get ahead of the curve. We talk about pre-creation of a record to make sure that the governance and the, the policies are, are right and the people are trained. Part of our, um, and I'm going way over time now, Maureen, but part of our digital continuity policy is, is to um, improve the professional standards of records management in each agency. We're, we're um, stipulating that every agency has to have a chief information governance officer. Now again, it's cutting red tape. You don't have to employ a new person. You don't have to build a new office. This can be a responsibility that somebody you already employ can assume. But we have chief financial officers. We have chief legal counsels. For this very reason that you raise, every agency head, every secretary needs someone they can turn to who's expert, who's qualified, who's professional, and can provide reliable advice to the agency head that they have upheld their information management obligations. And these are the changes that we're trying to affect so that at the beginning of that process, from the moment those records are created, it's understood this is valuable, this must be kept. And it has to be kept in a chain of evidence so that all of the auditing and the, the authenticity is maintained. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying mistakes weren't made in the past. Of course, they were made in the past. But everything we're doing today is trying to to bring that together through better governance, better policies and better uh, resources. Thank, so you thank you very much. Thank you. Um, for an excellent and obviously
stimulating lecture. I would remind people about the ASPG group that's gathering in the Queen's Cafe if you'd like to further your discussion because obviously we didn't explore everything today. Thank you again very much. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.